This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. Today on the show, I have Victor Sprandio. Victor was originally featured in the New Market Wizards. Victor has a Wall Street career that spans back to 1966. From trader to historian to a man with a very strong public policy view. Much to be learned. Many cool experiences. I hope you enjoy. Hey, Victor, Mike Covell. Hi, Mike. How are you? Okay, good. Thank you. So here's, here's my, my out-of-the-gate question, and I'm going to try and make it as big as I can. You know, if we look back at the dot-com bubble, we look what happened after the dot-com bubble, we see the, we see the Fed lower rates down, uh, you know, our, creates another bubble, real estate, stocks. Uh, we see what happens in 2008. Then we see even more Fed action. We see QE. We see ZERP. We see uh, older folks no longer have any kind of income. That's just gone out the window. And we see a stock market at arguably fairly elevated levels. And, and I want you to expand on the public policy directions and how that's happened. But I want you to also weave in your trading perspective. Because even though all of that has happened, there's still a way to trade that and make money at it, even if you are entirely against the public policy of it, which I know you are. Okay, so I'll start with... With uh, let me start with a specific, rather than because you gave me a lot to chew on there. If I if you if you, if you could just give me one topic first to begin on, because I wouldn't know where to begin unless you directed me a little bit. So where would you like me to begin? Well, you know, I think it's really interesting that an entire generation let's just pick America, has been told, save your money. You know, you'll get some interest income when you get into your 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. Uh, and now there's no more interest income. And, and I know people have to be saying to themselves, even if they don't understand the Fed as you do, they have to be saying to themselves, what happened? Where did it go? Well, okay, fine. And, and let me give you context on this. If you go back to what I call the modern era, which is 1961 forward, <clears throat> that's arbitrary, but it has to do with Kennedy and what happened after Kennedy versus Eisenhower, which was post-World War II, and, and it just is my arbitrary designation. It doesn't have any meaning in what I'm going to say. If you took the uh, the compounded rate of interest on 30 years, and on T-bills, and then you average the two uh, over this 50, now four-year period, the compounded rate of return is 6.2%. That includes the last five years. So what basically normal interest rates are in the last 54 years is 6.2% on average. Now, and the average is a bad term, but here I'm just giving you T bills versus thirty years, and and by the way, they break down in the in the sevens for the thirty years seven point two and and five point two something in that order. Uh, I'm I'm not being specific. Maybe a little higher or lower because I'm using memory. Now, if that interest rate op- uh, occurred today, uh, and I'm going to make a different point than answering your question. In other words, where is the money gone? I'll get to that with seventeen. Trillion four hundred billion stated debt. If you look at the world debt clock, uh, you're talking about a trillion dollars in interest. We're actually paying about two hundred and fifty, two hundred twenty-five a bi- a billion. Uh, so you're really, if you can imagine what would happen if the debt keeps rising at the rate. From this is going to surprise even you, Mike. From 1978 
And that's an arbitrary date, too. You can pick any date you wish. I just picked that date. <laughs> From 1978 to date, the compounded growth rate of debt is 9.1% a year. 91 So if you read the current release of the CBO report, it shows the debt increasing by about half of that, 45 for the next 10 years, with no recessions. And that's what, of course, what elevates the debt. You could always go down uh, a bit. And, and then we're talking about the gross debt compounding now. We're not talking about the ratio of debt to GDP, which is a which is a fallacious number when you have to pay the interest on it. So with that background, now we come to the people who have saved and done all the things their parents taught them to do because of the depression and, and because it's prudent and intelligent, and they they get zero on T-bills. It's about four beeps. <clears throat> And they get 370-ish if they do 30 years, and most people don't, so they go to the 10-year, and that's about 260, and then you got to pay taxes on that. So you really, the real answer to what is happening is that the government is stealing their money. The amount of money in the last five years, this is the sixth year of zero interest rates. If you were, a, let's say, a very conservative, retired person and you had your money in T-bills, uh, you, you're entitled to the compounded rate, which I'm going to say is about 5.2% by memory. It could be a tad higher than that for my designated modern era, 61 point. And if you added that up till the end of this year, which uh, Janet Yellen has claimed that interest rates are not going to change this year, they may change late next year is what the you know, what the guidance is. <clears throat> You're talking about 37.5% of every dollar is being, uh, I use the word stolen, the, the fancy word is repression, by the federal government because they set those rates. And they are the biggest borrowers, so they reap the biggest benefits. The second biggest borrower is corporate America. And corporate America, as you can see, is benefiting as well because they're buying back stock, borrowing money cheap or out of earnings, and they're reducing the float. And basically, their earnings are showing a slight increase. And basically, it's not coming from production or hiring people. It's coming from firing people, if anything. But the key is, is that, you know, people have been, have been, uh, uh, have been repressed and their savings have been stolen by the government. So I could certainly understand, uh, them feeling this, although they don't go to the White House with pitchforks. See, that's the problem in America. There's no constituency to change it. Certainly the CEOs of the Fortune 500 companies love this. They're not going to change it. Traders are not going to change it. Anybody that's an investor is not going to recommend change. The only people that would would want to see a change is really the middle-class saver retiree who's living on his principal, and they are not uh, an activist group as such. So it is, it is, it, it, morally, to me, it is the most immoral thing that, that can occur in the world because it is just transferring this debt to the children who don't even have a vote. The people that have a vote, they should, you know, they should vote their way towards getting a fair shake, but the, but the real moral dilemma is that this is going to be transferred to future generations who have no vote, and they're going to get stuck with the tab. Hey, Victor, isn't this, isn't this essentially a bribe, though? Isn't the S&P a bribe? Like, hey, we took your interest income away, but look how high the S&P is. Don't complain. Well, you sure it is if you are participating. And, and for you to participate, which is part of your initial question, if for you to participate, you have to have one thing. When you say trade to make money, you have to believe in the in the Fed. The Fed has got your back because they will not let the market fall. And whenever the a matter of fact, if you listen carefully to U.S. politicians and the Fed, they never refer to the economy falling. They always refer. 
that if stocks are going down, it's bad. So since when does the Fed mandate have to do with keeping stocks higher per se? And, and the wealth effect, just for the audience, the wealth effect is, 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 uh, has meaning to three tenths of one percent of the wealth accumulated, meaning that if the market went up 10 percent, it would be worth 30 basis points in spending. And why is that? Is because a bulk of the, of the stock market is held by pension funds. And they don't spend the money. Of course, they need it for their retirees. And it is an actuarial concept for sure. But a great deal of their money is also in fixed income where they're being killed. So, but, but the wealth effect has a very small, uh, let's say, input into spending. Because a lot of it, as I say, it doesn't go to people who spend. The, the point is, it is a very poor policy uh, if you were to be an economist making a judgment on, well, what do you do to make the economy grow? Uh, the stock market going up is a very poor instrument to help the economy. I almost wonder, should the Fed just set the appropriate target rate for the S&P? Just say, this is the level that we want? I really don't think that, I mean, now we're talking academically. <clears throat> I don't think that that's their place. Their, their place in theory, and it is a theory, because it, it really is these mandates that they're given to keep uh, uh, prices stable and to, and to maximize uh, uh, employment. Now, they're doing poorly at both. I mean, you could look at the unemployment rate and say, gee, it's 67 and that's not horrible, it's pretty good, but then you look at the participation rate and you say this is the lowest participation calculation to get to that number, you know, since the 70s. So it's a very, they're doing a terrible job in certainly the mandate of unemployment, and they're also doing a terrible job if you look at a little bit longer term in keeping prices stable from 1971 when we went off the gold standard to January to the last reported number, the compounded rate for inflation using the CPI, which these are official numbers, I happened to calculate this the other day, so I know this is correct, is 4.26%. Now, do you know anybody, now I know you're on the other side of the world here, but do you know anybody you can imagine that is a salaried middle class worker that has gotten a net, now remember there's taxes when you go into higher brackets, a net 4.2% compounded wage increase per year for 43 years? Nobody. Nobody is in that position. So I'm only saying that the system of, if you want to know why the world is growing at the rates they're growing at, and, and I'm going to name the countries, the U.S., the EU, U.K., and Japan, to, to name the biggest countries, at less than 2% in the last five years. I mean, in the U.S., it's actually lower in the other countries. It's because of a trend towards socialism. If you really understand what socialism is, you can look it up. The, the, the whole world is moving towards socialism, and socialism doesn't work. And therefore, you don't get jobs from socialism, and you don't get growth. You can only get some money that other people make temporarily until they either move to places where you can't get their money, or they stop working and they put their money in, in, in munis and in tax freeze, and therefore the world slows down and eventually it goes into recession and, and dies. So I, I don't know if that was the big picture answer. I tried to cover a lot of bases there for you uh, and give you some numbers and statistics, which is what I do for a living here. But the, the key is you're never going to grow if you don't change this spending unlimited amounts of money on anything that can bribe a voter and you don't allow for policies to growth, in, especially in small business. Uh, big business has is, is, is done pretty well, except if you really want to be an analyst, Right now, the 12-month trailing S&P earnings is 20.4%. 
and you can we can all speculate on what the next 12 months is going to be. But let's just say you right now you're paying if you buy the S&P 20.4 times earnings. And where did those earnings come from? The top line is actually flat or lower in many cases. The bottom line is fractionally higher <clears throat> in most cases. And it comes from the low interest rate policies, so they get a benefit, they get a special privilege. The firing of people, which doesn't, let's say, do what the Fed supposedly is created to do, of course, that's a different issue. But And third, it comes from buybacks and, and tax breaks, like Apple putting most of their production in Ireland where the, where the, where the tax rate is much lower than, than anywhere else, and therefore benefiting from tax breaks, which big companies can do, little companies can't. And so you're really getting all of the earnings that exist from what I call gimmicks. None of it is from growing companies. It's the gimmicks that allow you to continue to show bottom line earnings growth to some degree, to a very small degree. Now, why somebody would pay 20 times earnings for that and pray that the next 12 months, it'll the, the, the S&P will be 15 times earnings, is beyond me. It's a disconnect. There is no fundamental reason why the market's this high, except you believe in the Fed. The Fed has got your back. And that, that's it. You, sh- you shift right to where I wanted to go next, which is, you know, you're mentioning the assorted ways you can look at the fundamentals. We can talk about the Fed suppressing volatility. We can look at some of these high flyers, the Teslas, the Pricelines, the Twitters, the LinkedIn, the Netflix, these things that have dot-com valuations. But as I'd like to kind of, as we go in a slightly different direction, you've cut your teeth on trading. I mean, you were very well known for being in the New Market Wizards book. So even though these fundamentals might be, as you describe, the market prices themselves are going in a different direction. And so though, even though you have these public policy views, you're also a trader. And, and the way to trade, and I'm not pitching my book here, <laughs> but in, in, in my second book, there's a chapter on day trading. And the most conservative, because again, if you're buy and hold, which has been very profitable in the last five years, if you're one day you will wake up and there will be a difficulty selling anything. And by the way, just as a point of order, the volume today is 41% of the volume of 207. So if you took any given month recently and you added up the volume and you took the same month in 207, you'd find that the volume is 60% lower. 60%. So when there is a reason to sell, (laughs) it's going to be very difficult to cash out. Let me, let me also, it was kind of keep this trading conversation going. Obviously you've been exposed to wall street since as a very young age. In fact, if I'm, I'm looking here and I'm not sure, uh, wall street, uh, a quote described as a quote boy and, 1966. I mean, we're you've seen just about everything on the street. I mean, so we've started our conversation off with a big macro policy perspective, but from a trading perspective, you've seen quite a bit. Where I would love to also go, if if you wouldn't mind, you know, you've had a chance to be a portfolio manager for some of the biggest names that people would recognize: George Soros, Leon Cooperman. What what did you know? I, I can look at a guy like George Soros. I can I can see his public policy statements in the news, they sound very different than yours. Maybe they're similar, but they sound different. But from a trading perspective, you must have hit it off when you worked with him. Yes. George Soros, who uh, uh, is surprisingly technical uh, at times, he 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 absolutely uses technical analysis uh, in, an, in a very high-order way. And what I mean by that, let's give you an example, and this is a true example. If the, if the 200 day moving average was in a downtrend and if stocks were rallying into that downtrend, he would short at the 200 day moving average. So he would, he would use typical processes and technical analysis as I would use. 
and and he he does things very similar to me. Now I'll tell you where the differences are and why he's so successful. What he would do is he forms a ma- global macro uh, uh, analysis. So he'll say, okay, the uh, the Canadian dollar is making a low. I'm making that up, and uh, he would say, okay, I'm going to and and they 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 have to lower taxes to get the economy going. And so what he would do is buy the Canadian dollar and take a position, and then he would utilize the technicals around that position. The difference is that when he plays, he plays very, very big at turning points. So if he believes that the Canadian dollar were headed north, uh, he wouldn't just buy 10%. He'd buy 200%. <laughs> See what I mean? And that's where he, he makes his big killings by, by playing the biggest at what he believes are global, or are fundamental macro turning points. They're not based on technicals. They're based on fundamentals. And then as it rises, he is more technical. Like, I, I, there was rumors that he sold silver at 50, you know, when it was spiking up and it was up like 13 or 12 days in a row. And that he, that would be him. See, if you get a, a big move up and you get a round number and you get a, a very extreme move in silver when it went from, I mean, it really went from almost uh, below the teens to 50 and then went to 50 and then everybody, it was kind of a magic uh, bell ringing where everybody sold because it spiked up and it was a technical signal to sell. There was no fundamental reason why it went to 50 per se, and there was no, there was no fundamental reason to sell at 50. It was all based on, on prices and effectively a volume climax at the top of a move instead of at the bottom of a move, which you could have. So he's very technical, uh, but his biggest strength is his ability to to believe in what he's thinking in an extremely big way. And that's why his returns are pretty much, uh, you know, top of the, top of the list. Plus he charges a very, when he used to be, Quantum Fund was, when it was a public fund, it charged one in 15, which is a very reasonable hedge fund fee structure as opposed to two in 20. But you've also had some other strategies that you've been involved in developing the DTI index for one, that would be a more of a longer term strategy. So I guess in your career, you have been exposed to multiple different types of strategies. Well, yes. And all things for its, for its, for its purpose. And, and the DTI was a trend following, very conservative approach to allowing people to participate in the managed futures business without having to put up where most managed futures traders want 500000 or a million dollars, et cetera, and, 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 and they're looking for high net worth individuals, the, the DTI can be sold to the average person, and it had no leverage. And it was very basically a 10% winner up until uh, 211 uh, actually, until Obama came into into this administration, and and it, it, the managed futures business and commodity business has changed because uh, it really changed in April of 2011. I mean, this is worthy of your commentary to your viewers. The 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 top was the end of April of 2011. Everything topped on that day. The stocks. Commodities, you name it, it virtually, and I'm not saying 100%, but 95% of everything topped on that day. Why? Because the end of QE2 was coming. And people played from August 26th, uh, at the, at the uh, Steamboat Colorado speech by Bernanke to the end of the program. I mean, if you recall, it was $600 billion and it was going to end in June. So at the end of April, literally the bell rang again because the program was coming to an end and everybody sold. So from that period on, and then Bernanke, uh, and this is an accurate portrayal here, Ben Bernanke was very proud of, of, of saying, well, he was responsible for the stock movement upwards. Again, this the wealth effect concept that they play on. 
And sure enough, the S&P was up 30%, uh, almost exactly. Uh, Russell was up uh, more than that. But the Dow Jones UBS Commodity Index, a long-only commodity index, very well-known and diversified, was up 36%. We had a long-short index, the LSC, which trades on, on the New York Stock Exchange. It's a note. It's all commodities. It was up 73%. In that period. So Bernanke wanted to take credit for moving stocks up, which was part of the policy uh, with wealth effect, but he didn't want responsibility for the commodities. So once the, he got criticized for the commodities moving up, the government started to change the laws, and they made the laws, uh, let's say, dis- to discourage U.S. buyers of commodities. And uh, an example would be, for example, the the... The IRS would not issue a letter to this day. They stopped this. They won't issue a letter telling you that futures income is good income. So under 40 Act purposes, you could wind up if you, if they don't give you that letter and, and they want to pursue you, you, you wind up being a corporation. So now you pay 35% on the earnings and then you pay also on the distribution. And, of course, 40 Act is exempting that. You get paid only when you get a distribution. Uh, <clears throat> and it's like kind. So if, if the mutual fund held a stock for a year and a day, you'd get distributions that would be taxable at the maximum uh, uh, long-term rate, which is 20% plus the Medicare VIG now. But the, the bottom line is, is that there are many things, the Dodd-Frank bill, Made it made the swap uh, margins much much higher for people. Uh, th- there are many rules and regulations they change. We we had a ETF that we put filed with the SEC uh, through a sponsor. At least we don't do that. We get sponsors to do that, and this is now going on four and a half to five years. They won't approve it. They won't approve anything with commodities. So they just don't want to create demand for commodities. Victor, it's interesting that from a regulatory perspective, like I, I personally don't think that the the classic trend following strategies have gone anywhere other than the typical cycles. But I think from a regulatory structure standpoint, for the firms that want to be trading in those markets for clients in the United States of America, you have to wonder where it's ultimately going. And ultimately, it looks like London because the London, <laughs> the London traders that are that are trading these strategies have just exploded with assets under management, and the U.S. continues to contract, which ultimately probably gets back to the beginning of our conversation, which is just this the government hand uh, involved in everything. And so this fantastic enterprise and industry that has existed for many decades in America is we're just talking about another one that's being constricted, aren't we? Yes. It is, and I'm just bringing out the point of why, if you look around, for example, John Henry has closed his doors, and many of the old classic line uh, trend-following strategies are are just having the hardest time and are down, and that's because trends are very short-lived because of the policies, in other words, because of economic policies, but there's also a lack of demand but, I mean, when you get the Dow Jones UBS commodity index dropping three years, that has nothing to do with long short, right? That has to do with the demand for commodities. And there has been this inhibited uh, rule structure that has stopped people from buying commodities, as institutions used to do, to hedge their pension fund bets. Exactly. So uh, that that has created lower demand. What happens when the next... The next swan swims in. The next black swan swims in. I mean, we, uh, you know, there's going to be, are there even a lot of these equity portfolios even have less hedge than they might have had in the last prior decade? Well, certainly the pension fund world is going to be harmed. Um, I think individuals don't have their, the issues, right? I mean, you can still go out and open a futures account and buy with minimum margin futures, you can still buy gold gold itself, and you can still buy ETFs. The pension world is now restricted, basically, or it's being directed to ETFs. 
that's where it's being directed to. It isn't being directed to the futures market directly. Uh, um, many pension funds restrict the purchase of gold outright. There are exceptions, but most of them uh, restrict your ability to buy gold because it's not it's it's referred to as a collectible under ERISA, and therefore it makes it speculative, and you can be sued as a trustee. And that's the last thing ERISA wants. That's why they don't use leverage in pension in the pension world, because you don't want to be sued for being quote unquote imprudent, which is the reason you sue people in in that world. Um, so I only say that you know average people can still hedge. The pension world is 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 restricted, and they're going to be the ones most harmed. So anybody that is expecting an annuity, if you will, or a pension payment from uh, especially a public pension plan, as well as a private one, uh, is going to be in shock <laughs> when, <laughs> well. when, when they when they don't get their money. Now, again, that's when the you know, you know when when the world changes again, and it probably will change when there's an uncontrollable event. And this is not nearly talked about uh, much. And I'm going to mention a couple of them. What if there was a, a a war between China and Japan over those little islands? What if Israel, which is, by the way, you know, Iran is 50 times bigger than Israel. It's a 49 and a fraction, to be exact. And the population of Israel is, ten, is about one-tenth the population of Iran. So if Iran gets the bomb... It would be very easy for it to uh, do, if you remember the movie Dr. Strangelove, an analysis where <laughs> if you go to nuclear war, uh, you can win under certain conditions if you want to call it winning. But the point is is that you know there is a day where Israel is just not going to let Iran get the bomb. When that day is, uh, you know, I certainly can't say, and no one can say except if you are connected inside the Israeli uh, government as such, but the point is that is a risk. You've got the other risk now is is Russia, you know, which is obvious and, and potentially a feeling its strength to move further and further into developing uh, uh, what was the Soviet Union to rebuilding that, and and you have you have other risks, South Korea, North Korea. I mean that uh, although none of these things play out. Markets, by the way, do not discount war until the war occurs. They don't, nobody plays for war until the war begins. If you look at history, and, and many, many times there's been threats of war and all of this, and the markets don't really care. And, it, you know, we can get into reasons for that, but it, they don't. So here, if something happens, the, normally you get inflation whenever there's war, wherever it is. So you will get a decline in in the dollar per se, uh, although you do have people who run into the dollar for safety in their minds. But uh, you can also get currencies around the world dropping against gold and silver because they're going to be inflating that to pay for various things that occur during war. So really, gold and silver at its lows or coming off its lows is. You know, if somebody said, what would you invest in? Now, of course, I've been a perennial gold bull here uh, since 203, I've recommended, 204, I'm sorry, I've recommended it. And, and I still recommend it, and I looked at last year as a, a sell-off, but I would still suggest it to be a hedge to your portfolio. Now, I'm not being George Soros and telling you to go out and buy 100% gold. I'm saying that everybody should own between 5 and maybe more aggressively, 15% of their portfolio in gold and silver and mining stocks are at their lows. Although I don't trade mining stocks, I buy the, I buy futures on the spot. But the the point is, is is that that is really where money should be going as an investor to hedge the risks that I just talked about. You know, Victor, we start this conversation off talking about public policy. Your views I, I share, and most of the people in my audience know that I share, one of the reasons I wanted to have you on. We talk about the various trading strategies that you have implemented, other ones that you've seen from other people. 
Um, and then now we talk about the situation, the potential black swans, what could happen, what unexpected could happen. I mean, ultimately, I think it, it leads back to, and I want you to comment on this, is human nature, the, the, the psychology of the individual. And I think human beings are the same. They're unpredictable. They're chaotic. Things happen. And ultimately, I think it comes down for the investor. They have to have a plan, something that they have worked through, something that makes sense, something that really can work for all seasons, don't they? I think investors really, I mean, they can trust the system. They can trust the Fed. They can trust that hopefully it will all be A-OK. But I think if they listen to someone like you in the course of this conversation, I think you're making the point of like, hey, there's a lot of moving parts here. And just trusting the system might not work out for you. Well, well, um, this is certainly musical chess. It won't work out <laughs> in the long run. <laughs> it all comes to a stop in this case, like I, uh, I mean, I've emphasized the debt growth around the world and the paper money creation around the world is, is outrageously obnoxious. It, there's no other word for it. It's just obnoxious. And it will end very badly. And I gave you the, the testimonial that if interest rates just went back to normal, uh, you'd be paying a trillion dollars in the U.S. five times the interest payments that it paid in the last several years. So if you, if you're only taking in about three, uh, let's call it optimistically 2.9 to three to three trillion, uh, dollars according to CBO this year, and you had a trillion dollar increase in the spending side from interest, that that would disturb some debt holders. <laughs> Let's just say it safely that way. Now, how could that happen without economic growth? It could happen through one of these war uh, situations I gave you. Israel attacks Iran uh, because it's such a small country, and it has to do that in advance, and all of a sudden oil goes to a hundred and seventy five or two hundred dollars a barrel, and you now have interest rates rise to offset that cost, and basically you're at never never land it's uncontrollable by the Fed. The Fed can't control that, so the dollar sinks, interest rates rise, the stocks go down in a big way and and people lose so yes, your point which was alluding to the question I believe you were asking me, the only way to protect yourself is extreme diversification. And you have to basically diversify, <clears throat> and, and this is what I would say probably the best hedge fund in the world is Bridgewater, uh, Ray Dalio, <clears throat> and he has he uses concepts, we use similar concepts coincidentally, but they're based on volatility balancing. Not uh, so. In other words, if you have a portfolio of of uh, uh, of, of one dollar, you you have to buy. Uh, if there were only two assets in the portfolio, and there were bonds, and there were stocks, and stocks have a fifteen PE, well, then you say, well, what are what are bonds average PE? And they'd be about seven and a half. Uh, excuse me, volatility, the standard deviation. So you'd buy twice as many bonds as you would stocks so that one can offset the other. Uh, when one usually goes down, the other goes up and vice versa. That's They're not correlated necessarily. They can be, but not necessarily, especially in bad times like 208. So, But in order to offset the risk of stocks, you have to own one-third stocks and two-thirds bonds. So that would balance the risk. That's what volatility balancing means. So if you have a, an expanded portfolio of, uh, let's say, 10 different strategy asset classes, and that would include real estate, and corporate bonds, and and uh, managed futures, and, and gold, and, and uh, stocks, and, and uh, different, uh, different uh, let's say, international exposure, uh, you'd want a lot of diversification and a lot of uh, uh, calculated based on the standard deviation of the amount you have in each asset class so that they are b approximately balanced. You'll never get it precisely. It's not a science. But if you have 3% in some asset class with a 10 vol, well, 
then you have to balance how much you buy elsewhere to match that vol so that they're approximately even, and that will protect your portfolio in virtually any environment, in theory. <laughs> Anything can happen. But in theory, that, that, that will do it, and that's why Bridgewater is so successful. You know, we're, we're kind of running out of time, and I, but I do want to ask you one question, kind of hopefully you won't think it's too unusual, but, you know, you've been on Wall Street very successful for a long time. What were you like as a young man? How did you make this transition? What were you like as a 13, 14, 15-year-old guy? What, what inspired you? How did you, how did you come into this world? What, what, what were the triggers? That's a very easy, maybe a smiling answer for your audience. I loved numbers. Now, I'm not a math uh, a genius of any kind. I mean, I'm basically like odds. I, if I wasn't doing what I'm doing, I'd probably be a very good bookie. Okay, so that, you know, because I like odds, <laughs> I like to put a risk reward on things. <clears throat> and it was always a passion of mine to understand that risk reward. And I played a lot of poker. We, I lived in a neighborhood in Jackson Heights, Queens, New York, and these were residential houses and they were built on blocks. And there must have been 30 houses on, uh, let's say 20 on each side of the block with the, uh, with an alleyway in the middle. And the kids used to come out and play ball and whatnot in the alleyway. And you'd meet all, you know, maybe 20, 50, 20 or more people, both the men, boys. And we'd all on the weekends play poker. And this is in the early teenage days. And I was always reading odds and, you know, playing the odds and uh, you don't draw it an inside straight at 11 to 1 unless there's 15 to 1 in the pot and things like, you know, the, the typical gambler's kind of uh, 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 usage of winning. And in this case, uh, <clears throat> my mother <clears throat> basically was very dis, dis was alarmed, I'll use that word, at me doing this because she felt that I wasn't going to do something that was, uh, let's say, worthy of of uh, of working. So I went to work for a bank. It was actually Chase, and they were teaching me how to be a teller. <clears throat> now that is the most boring task in the world. <laughs> I couldn't I couldn't do that. So then I said, Well, wait a minute. Numbers, Wall Street, odds, risk reward, statistics. So I went to work for Pershing as this quote boy. Uh, basically, what does that mean? <laughs> a quote, well, it is that Pershing was a broker's broker, so they would execute for all of the firms that were not in New York, that were all over the country, and in those days, they did this with teletype, so they had a machine that would spit out an order, it would come from A.G. Edwards in St. Louis, let's say, and you'd, you know, they'd be a dedicated, they must have had 30 of these people, not exaggerated, all around a, a horseshoe pit, and you you get an order, you know, buy a thousand IBM or buy a hundred IBM, and you'd run over to the place where IBM was traded on the floor to the person who gave it was closest to the booth of IBM, and you'd give him this order, and he'd have the earphones on and call down and say buy a hundred IBM, and you'd get these really fast, unbelievable, quick executions. They were very efficient, and then you'd get the order executed. You know, bought IBM at. 302, and you'd bring it back to the teletype operator, that's what I would do, and I would I would give them the execution, and ma many of them were in executions, they were quote-unquote quotes, right? Give me a quote on IBM, and there were no machines doing this, you had to, you had to literally do this by teletype in 66. The Quotron machines came in a little later on, and then offices like this could get quotes. But the same principle applied to executions. You couldn't get executions unless you did it this way if you have a small company that was on the outskirts of the United States, not in New York. So, in effect, that's what that was, and, and there was a tape trader there named Milton Leeds, and he wrote a book, and he was a tape trader for Pershing. He was a partner, and he, I basically watched him trade. Now, he really didn't use a lot of skill. He basically would read the ticket tape, and if it said 
Johnson and Johnson increases the dividend, he would immediately buy ten thousand Johnson and Johnson. And since the order clerk was right in front of him, that was five feet from the booth, <laughs> he would sort of always win. <laughs> okay, because as soon as the stock started, I to like tick that up, game. He started to tick up. He would sell. And the account, by the way, was 99. That was the account. So he buy 10,099 means it's a firm trade. And, and he, that's what he did for a living. And he was a great tape trader. And it was, he was mentioned in books. But anyway, I saw that in action. And, and that was a very stimulating, uh, uh, vision of Milton Leeds, you know, suspenders, gray hair. You know, he was the typical part. But anyway, that's how I got into, <laughs> got into trading is watching this guy and being involved in this process. Of, of executions for that Pershing did for other people, and that's where I, his name was Quote Boy, and it was 65 bucks a week. I went to college at night, and I worked in the day. Well, uh, that is an awesome story. I, I, I appreciate you sharing. That's, uh, that's, that's very cool. I think, you know, in this day and age where people, where everything's digital, it's harder and harder to, for, for younger people to have those experiences, to kind of see how the plumbing and the pipes all work, so to speak. And I, I think it's cool to, to look back and, and, and experience and think about how things uh, evolved. And uh, obviously, you're still involved and still involved today. So it's, it's very cool and very, uh, very uh, lengthy career. But I appreciate I appreciate you sharing with me today. Well, I, well uh, just one thing about opportunity when sure. I started my options for in 71, we had 202 direct wires to different brokerage firms. If you want to get a picture of the divert, you see right now you've got five firms that you could go to, maybe mm. six. But I had 202 at that time. See, small business, you can get a break in for a job. When you have a, a small amount of uh, uh, oligopoly, if you want to call it that, you get much less ability to if you will, start out in business. So as things have merged and uh, the business has changed, it's much more difficult to get in to the Goldman Sachs of the world to, to get a position. So Wall Street's become a lot difficult, a lot more difficult. Yeah. I think Silicon Valley probably offers more opportunity for young people today. You know, go invent something, write some code. Uh, it seems to, seems to offer a, a lot more of that uh, opportunity that you, you might have saw as a young man. Yeah, well... Silicon Valley is what I'd recommend these days, yes. Yeah. Hey, Victor, listen, I appreciate it. Where is the best place for people to go and check you out more information? Which website would you like to direct them to? Jesus, you know, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we have, we have a, a website called, uh, the name of one of my companies is Alpha Financial Technologies. LLC and Alpha Financial is basically like Standard & Poor's. That's where the DTI is. We manufacture indices; they're complex indices, and then we license them for you know royalty fees, if you want to uh, call it that. Just like S and P, when it creates an index, it, it usually licenses it for for a certain amount of money to use it. So AFT. Uh, you know, if you go to AFT, uh, LLC.com or, uh, you know, with the three W's before, you'll, you'll, you'll find some information. Uh, we, we don't do a lot of business with the public, let's put it that way. I mean, we, we're, <laughs> our, our clientele is usually banks and mutual funds, but I mean, you can go and find out, you know, all kinds of information there. Hey, listen, I appreciate it taking the time today and, um, uh... Hopefully we can talk again in the future and hopefully we can talk again after that monumental moment happens that changes the, the direction of everything again. Cause we know it's coming. We just don't know when. Exactly. But when it, can, when it happens, you'll know it. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. Fed, it has to be an event that the Fed or printing money can't necessarily control. And that, yeah. that is the, that is the essence of the, the problem. If the Fed can't can print money to solve the problem, like an Iran-Israeli war, then that's when the problems will really start to surface, and you will know the event occurred. Victor, I think you've provided some great wisdom today. I'm sure people will enjoy. Okay. Thank you. Have a good day. Take care. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money and up down and surprise markets. 
Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.